सेटेलाइट और रिपीटेटिव डीएनए जनरली रेफर्स टू द डीएनए हुज बेसिक्वेंस इज रिपीटेड मेनी टाइम्स थ्रू आउट द जीनोम ऑफ एन ऑर्गेनिज्म इट्स वेरी कॉमन इन यूकेरियोट्स अकाउंटिंग फॉर अबाउट हाफ ऑफ द टोटल डीएनए फॉर एग्जांपल इन केस ऑफ मैमल्स इट्स प्रोपोर्शन आल्सो वेरीज इन डिफरेंट ऑर्गेनिजम्स एंड कैन बी ऑफ कोर्स डिवाइडेड ऑन द बेस ऑफ सर्टेन कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स इनटू वेरियस टाइप्स वाइल सम ऑफ दिस डीएनए सर्व्स एज ए useful purpose but a significant proportion of it is of uncertain function and may be treated as junk or sometimes also referred as selfish dna because without having any function it somehow manages its uh, perpetuation though used quite often synonymously or interchangeably satellite or repetitive dna they are two actually different things Let's now talk in some detail about them. What is the satellite and repetitive DNA? Let's first understand satellite DNA. Satellite DNA in fact is serially repeated DNA sequences of one or a few nucleotides with a repeat length of up to 250 nucleotides that are not transcribed and are commonly located in the heterochromatin part of the chromosomes. the term satellite dna was derived from the way in which repetitive dna is repeated uh, or rather when dna is prepared as a pure fraction it forms a separate uh, band in the rest of the cellular dna repetitive dna so far is concerned it refers to the substrings of the genome that repeat multiple times and includes of course satellite dna and so called interspersed repeated dna sequences as well the later i mean interspersed repeated dna sequences are interspersed throughout the chromosomes in hundreds or uh, thousands of individual copies each about 300 nucleotides long unlike satellite dna these repeated dna's are generally transcribed moreover different instances of the repeat elements can have slightly different patterns also it is also highly prevalent in eukaryotes i mean those organisms with visible nucleus and uh, well defined nuclear uh, parts cell structure as opposed to the bacteria or prokaryotes quantum of repetitive dna varies in different organisms for example in case of homo sapiens the percentage of repetitive dna is about 21% while as in mouse it's around 35% in calf it is 42% in drosophila let me tell you it is the highest say 70% and if we talk about plants in case of wheat it is 42% in case of pea 52% in case of maize 60% fungi such as saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, which is in fact a yeast 5% of its genome is comprised of the repetitive dna and as i told you this is more prevalent in eukaryotes and as such prokaryotes have very less quantum of this repetitive dna for example in case of e coli it just comprises 0.3% of the total genome and let me tell you here that repetitive dna elements comprise a major component of the plant genome and studying these sequences or these elements is very essential for our understanding of the nature and consequences of the plant genome size variations between the different species and for also studying the large scale organization and evolution of uh, plant genomes now very interesting question that i will come to is why to study repetitive dna at all as i told you in case of plants it's very important for different reasons generally speaking these repeats they are said to drive evolution in diverse ways through different means and apart from this repetitive dna's are generally not found to have any function apparently yet they are carried Uh, along generations across uh, so many years of evolution 
And then the third important reason is homology searches need repeat masking. I mean, especially for avoiding explosion of unnecessary results. And also, let me tell you, repeats or repeat sequences, they also contain information about parentage. So there are many reasons for studying this uh, repetitive or satellite DNA. The first evidence for repetitive DNA came from density gradient analysis of eukaryotic DNA. Density gradient analysis or procedure, let me tell you, was first used by Messelson and Stey to demonstrate semi-conservative replication of E. coli chromosomes. The density of six molar cesium chloride is about 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter. And if such a solution is centrifuged at a very high speed for long enough period of time, density gradient will be established because of the equilibrium between two things. First, the sedimentation of the cesium chloride to the bottom of the centrifuge tube as a result of the centrifugal force and second diffusion of the cesium chloride towards top of the centrifuge tube. Well, when the DNA of a prokaryote such as E. coli is isolated, fragmented and centrifuged to equilibrium in a cesium chloride density gradient, the DNA usually forms a single band in the gradient at a position where the cesium chloride density is equal to the density of the DNA containing about 50% of GC base pairs. And it is important to note that DNA density increases with the increasing GC content because as you know GC bonds are much stronger than the AT bonds in the DNA and make it much more tighter and more dense. On the other hand, cesium Chloride density gradient analysis of eukaryotic DNA usually reveals the presence of one large band of DNA, usually called as the man band DNA, and one to several small bands. These small bands of DNA are called satellite bands, and the DNA embodied in them is referred to as satellite DNA. The satellite DNA upon isolation and analysis reveals repeating sequences of variable lengths in different organisms. And so far the chromosomal location of satellite DNA is concerned. Chromosomal location of satellite DNA have been determined by a technique called in situ hybridization, which usually involves annealing single-stranded isolated uh, radioactive satellite DNAs or complementary RNA sequences synthesized using satellite DNA as a template directly to denatured DNA in chromosome quash preparations and so on. Now, after washing out the non-hybridized radioactive materials, the location of the satellite DNA sequences in the chromosomes are determined by autoradiography. They are uh, usually found in the heterochromatic region of the chromosomes. I mean non-transcribing region of the chromosomes or inactive region of the chromosomes. But please note that a repetitive DNA sequence will be identified as satellite DNA only if the sequence has a base composition sufficiently different from that of the main band DNA. Only then it is recognized as a distinct band in the density gradient, otherwise it won't be. Apart from these techniques, DNA renaturation kinetics gives a more complete picture of the repetitive DNA complexity and frequency. In fact, the time required for reassociation of particular DNA sequences is inversely proportional to the number of times that sequence is present in the genome. Obviously, highly repetitive DNA sequences will renature very rapidly. Why? Because due to more number of, more possibility of collisions between the uh, current strains. This repetitive DNA can be classified into various types, starting from, say, the satellite DNA, mini satellite DNA is another type, then the other is micro satellite DNA, transposable elements, even the lines, signs, and other retro sequences are considered as part of the uh, or the type of the repetitive DNA. Apart from these, the high copy number genes, for example, ribosomal genes or histone genes, or even the multifamily 
member genes, for example, hemoglobin or immunoglobulins, they are the types of repetitive DNA. Let's talk now in some detail about these types. So for the satellite DNA is concerned, as I told you earlier also, it forms a distinct band and its units comprise of 5 to 300 base pairs depending upon the species and they are repeated usually 105 to 106 times in the genome and as told earlier also they are located especially in the heterochromatic region non-transcribing region of the chromosomes the best examples of satellite DNA are centromeric DNA and the telomeric DNA let me tell you here that there are at least 10 distinct human types of satellite DNA. A single type may be more than 1% of the genome, equivalent to about three entire E. coli genomes, you can imagine. And second type is the mini satellite DNA, which is units are 15 to 400 base pairs, averaging about 20. And they are repeated 20 to 50 times. And so for their base pair length is concerned, it is uh, 1,000 to 5,000. And they are located generally in the euchromatic region of the chromosome as opposed to the satellite DNA which I told you is located in the uh, heterochromatic region of the chromosome. The best examples of the mini satellite DNA are DNA fingerprints tandemly repeated uh, but often in dispersed uh, in clusters also called as VNTRs variable number tandem repeats. The other type is the microsatellite DNA which the units of it are two to four base pairs, mostly of two averaging, repeated usually 10 to 100 times in the genome, and they are located also in the euchromatin part of the chromosome. And they are the most useful markers of the population level studies, quite often used there. Apart from these basic types, transposons or transposable elements in eukaryotes are also a type of repetitive DNA. Very famous, as you must be knowing, maze, ACDS elements, activator dissociation elements, for example. Likewise, in Drosophila melanogaster, P elements are also the transposable elements. Transposons, as you know, they're also called as jumping genes because they change their position in the genome uh, by way of jumping from one position to the other. And in case of many other organisms, say TC1, mariner elements, it's an exceptionally widespread uh, gene family in case of the animals, ranging from nematodes to mice. Apart from these, as I told you, signs, lines, and the retro sequences. Lines and signs are both the examples of dispersed repetitive DNA. Signs stand for, it is basically S-I-N-E-S, -E signs stand for short interspersed nuclear elements and lines for long interspersed nuclear elements. Signs, for example, ALU family in humans, its average length is about 280 base pairs and they are repeated about 700 into 10 to the power 3 to 1000 into 10 to the power 3 times in the genome, occurring all over the place, even in the introns. You must be knowing the difference between the introns and the exons. Introns are the transcribing regions and exons are the non-transcribing regions of the genome. And these signs and lines, they also propagate by transposition. Uh, so for the lines are concerned, line 1 is the best example, the copy number of which is 60 into 10 to the power 3 to 100 into 10 to the power 3, usually in the genome, and is a type of non-viral retro element, a transposon that can replicate and move around the genome by a process involving reverse transcription. The average length of line 1 element is 1.4 kbs or kilobase pairs. Apart from these, as I told you, the other types of uh, repetitive DNA include high copy number genes, for example, very famous uh, and commonly known ribosomal genes, histone genes, then the multifamily number member genes, uh, for example, hemoglobulins or uh, immunoglobulins. Well, apart from the different types of repetitive DNA that we have discussed so far, let me tell you that there is one more type of repetitive DNA that makes use of an RNA intermediate. And the best examples that fall under this group include retrons, retroposons, retrotransposons, retroviruses, 
very famous, for example, AIDS virus, pararetroviruses, and also many other retro sequences. And the fundamental mechanism behind all these types of uh, reverse transcriptase based uh, repetitive DNA intermediates is, you know, the central dogma of molecular biology has been that from DNA is synthesized the messenger RNA through the process of transcription and from messenger RNA are synthesized the proteins as a result of the translation. But the central dogma, this was changed after the discovery of the reverse transcriptase because it was found possible that using RNA as an intermediate, DNA can be synthesized in a reverse way. And all these examples are based on that very mechanism, which is very much well known in case of the HIV uh, or AIDS causing virus. As I told you earlier also that this repetitive DNA is genetically inactive. It is basically located in a genetically inactive heterochromatin part of the chromosome, the non-functional or you can say non-coding part of the chromosome. The functions of this type of DNA therefore are almost unknown. And as I told you earlier also that for a long period of time it was considered as junk DNA. However, some functions have been still attributed to this DNA. And these functions include, number one, they are found to or they have been attributed to have a role in the structural organization of the chromosomes. I mean, they have a structural or an organizational role in the chromosomes. As you know, chromosomes are the carriers of DNA, the basic genetic material. And the way this huge amount of DNA is packaged into the chromosome and very well packaged, highly efficient mechanism of packaging this is, it is basically made possible through the agency of these repetitive sequences also, apart from the other factors which are there very well known. Then they are also said to have their involvement in the chromosome pairing during meiosis. Meiosis is the process of reductive cell division, wherein chromosome number is reduced to half so as to maintain its number constant generation after generation. And this repetitive DNA or this non-functional part of the chromosome or heterochromatin is found to have a role in the pairing of chromosomes during this meiosis, which is an important phenomenon or process. And apart from this, in meiosis, the third important thing, as you know, is the process of crossing over and recombination, which is a fundamental process behind evolution. Repetitive sequences are known to or they have been attributed to be involved in this process of crossing over or recombination. And through recombination, in fact, the characters of different parents are basically recombined so that the progeny has uh, a different set of characters and uh, sometimes novel characters which basically help in the evolution of novel uh, genotypes and uh, to withstand other selection pressures. Then the fourth attributed function of repetitive DNA as a whole is the production of important structural genes such as histones, ribosomal RNA genes or uh, ribosomal protein genes. Well, the validity of all these postulated rules is by and large questionable and that's why it needs to be ascertained by robust and very well-focused experiments. Some people even think that the functions of the repetitive DNA are more than meets the eye and are therefore likely to be unraveled in future course of time. And from that perspective, repetitive DNA with different selective pressures from those acting on genes and evolutionary successful multi-gene uh, modules or families may show extensive differences in sequence motifs and abundance even between closely related species. Because the coding genes are of course under high selection pressure because they have to produce functional proteins and this repetitive DNA, the junk DNA, uh, so-called junk DNA I mean to say, since it is not directly involved in the synthesis of functional proteins, so how it basically withstands selection pressures or 
how it basically responds to different selection pressures is an interesting thing to note uh, in this process. The repetitive DNA in genome is also important for evolutionary, genetic, taxonomic and many kinds of other applied studies. Let me tell you here, apart from this or notwithstanding these attributed roles, a few repetitive DNA sequences are known to have very well-defined functions. For example, the telomeric sequences which are added at the ends of the most plant and animal chromosomes, the telomeres, they allow a linear replication unit to be maintained. Is, that's one of their functions. Then the second function is that they protect chromosome ends and overcome also the end uh, replication problems. So these are some of the fundamental roles and very well understood roles that have been found to be played by this repetitive or satellite DNA. The 18S or 5.8S and 5S ribosomal RNA genes or gene loci clustered at a small number of sites, they encode the structural RNA components of ribosomes. And you can understand how important they are. Mobile DNA sequences such as transposons and retrotransposons they make up a high proportion of most plant and animal genomes. So these are not only the attributed roles, these are almost very well verified roles that repetitive DNA is known to play. Well, a major class of the retro elements are these uh, repeated DNA, as I told you, ret retro elements. These retro elements encode the proteins necessary for their own reverse transcription and integration and sometimes it represents about 50% of the genome. As a result of their transcription into RNA, reverse transcription into DNA and integration into the genome, they have a dispersed distribution along the chromosomes. Noteworthy point here is that telomeres, ribosomal DNA and retro element sequences are all very ancient in evolutionary terms I am saying here and they are found in all animals and plants and because of this they are considered to be as early derivatives of the RNA world from the DNA based organism world. As you know being the students of evolutionary biology that earlier world was thought to be RNA world that has given rise to the present DNA world what we call as and these the role of these repeated sequences as I mentioned here is a strong evidence for the existence of that ancient RNA world that ultimately paved way for the present DNA based world and in case of plants so for the survey of major D DNA sequences in plant nuclear genome is concerned satellite DNAs have been found to have varying monomer lengths but usually 140 to 180 or 300 to 360 base pairs are the frequent more more, more frequent ones corresponding to mono or uh, dinucleosomes microsatellites are runs of the simple sequence repeats with motifs of 1 to 5 base pairs long while uh, mini satellites have longer and more complex repeating units up to 40 base pairs long. Telomeric DNA consisting of conserved 7 base pair repeats and if I exactly tell you the 7 base pairs are C, 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 T, A, 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 A. I mean 3 times C followed by T and 3 times A. It is added to the chromosome termini by the telomerase and retro elements amplifying and transposing via RNA intermediates are divided into mobile sequences with long terminal repeats, LTRs what we very commonly call as and non-LTRs, lines including uh, then the long interspersed nuclear elements I, as I was telling you lines basically prefer, refer to that and the related s signs short interspersed nuclear uh, genomes. This was unraveled by the team of uh, Avery McLeod and MCARTY in 1944 
uh, more than, I think, 16 years after. Uh, the team of these scientists, Oswald Avery, C. M. McLeod, and M. McCarthy, they revisited Grip's experiment and attempted a more reliable experiment. What they did was they extracted different suspected substances or molecules, including DNA, proteins, or other things, which uh, were found in the debris of the dead S cells of the Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, purified them, and tested them for transforming ability one by one, I mean one at a time. And for their experiments, they used a test tube assay instead of the mice. They mixed our bacteria with these different materials, and only those mixed with DNA were transformed into S bacteria, thereby substantiating the fact that the transforming factor basically is the DNA. These tests showed that the polysaccharides themselves do not, in fact, transform the rough cells. Therefore, the polysaccharide code, although undoubtedly concerned with the pathogenic reaction, is only the phenotypic expression of the virulence. Now, in screening the different groups, Avery and his colleagues found that only one class of molecule, DNA, induced the transformation of our cells. They, in fact, deduced that DNA is the agent that determines the polysaccharide character and hence the pathogenic activity or character of the organism. It seemed that providing our cells with S-DNA was tantamount to providing these cells with the S genes. So the message that we get from this experiment was, I mean, this experiment demonstrated that DNA is, in fact, the transforming principle. And it was the first demonstration that genes are composed of DNA, in a way. Experiments conducted by Avery and his colleagues were, of course, definitive, but many scientists at times were reluctant to accept DNA rather than proteins as the genetic material. Uh, the clincher was therefore provided by 1952 by Alfred Harshay and Amartya Cheese with the use of the Farge virus particles. What they did was they had reasoned that Farge infection must entail the introduction or injection into the bacterium of the specific uh, information that dictates viral reproduction. You know, viruses, when they in, uh, infect bacteria, they will take their machinery for the replication. And in this experiment, what they did, the phage is, you know, relatively simple in molecular constitution. Most of its structure is the protein, with DNA contained just inside the protein sheath of this head. The Hershey Chase experiment, which demonstrated that genetic material of phage is DNA, not proteins or any other thing, used two sets of T2 bacteriophages. In one set, the protein coat was labeled with the radioactive sulfur, S35, not found in DNA. In the other set, the DNA was labeled with radioactive phosphorus, P32, not found in proteins. Only P32 was injected into the E. coli, indicating thereby that DNA is, in fact, the agent necessary for the production of new phages. And the conclusion from this experiment is, is almost inescapable. We cannot escape from the conclusion, which says that DNA is basically the hereditary material. The phage proteins are mere structural packaging that is discarded after delivering the viral DNA into the bacterial cell. Well, the flow of information contained in uh, sequences of DNA bases takes place through two important processes, transcription and translation. Transcription is the process of synthesizing RNA molecules, messenger RNA molecules, as you must be knowing, from a DNA template, followed by translation, the process of protein synthesis from mRNA, which comprises the, in fact, these two processes, they comprise the central dogma of molecular biology. In fact, DNA possesses and conveys several types of information required in this central dogma. 
and these include that DNA possesses and conveys information about the sequences of all RNA molecules synthesized by the cell. B. It conveys information about the sequence of all amino acids in every protein synthesized by the cell. Then, it's the start and the stop signals of the synthesis of each RNA and each proteins are contained in it. Then, a set of signals that interacts with the cellular component and determines whether and when a particular RNA or a protein is to be made and how many molecules are to be made per unit time, this information is also there. Then signals that serve as origins and uh, terminators of the replication of DNA, they are also contained there. Very important factor is also the signals that provide essential features of chromosome structure, including the centromeres and the telomeres, they are also uh, contained in DNA itself. And you know, DNA is the agency of tr transmission of information from parents to the progeny. And for this, genetic information is transferred from parents to progeny organisms by faithful replication of parental DNA molecules, which is, as I told you earlier, also a complicated process, not even yet completely understood. Though we have made certain I mean many advances in the molecular genetics in the recent times. Moreover, the degree of accuracy required for DNA replication is much higher than for uh, transcription and as such cells have you know, developed additional mechanisms to ensure this precision and uh, correct uh, you know, transmission. The enzymes involved in the DNA replication possess an editing and proofreading system which in fact rejects the correctness of the nucleotides and removes about 99.9% .9 of few errors made in the initial insertion. Besides, the cells have evolved mechanisms to differentiate the newly synthesized DNA strain from the older parental strain. Special enzymes monitor the DNA at all times looking for mismatch base pairs. Any mismatch, if somehow creeps in, is corrected using the older DNA strand as a template. And this combination of error correcting mechanisms reduces the copy error rate in DNA duplication in cells to between, say, 1 in 10 raised power 9 and 1 in 10 raised power 10 base pair. Means very low possibility of transmitting an error. A very important factor for DNA to act as an ideal genetic material, you must know, is its stability also. Stability of DNA as a genetic material so far is concerned, it is important for two important reasons. One, for long-lived organisms, it has to last for more than 100 years or even more. And second, the information contained in DNA molecules is passed over succeeding generations over millions of years with only small change. And the stability of DNA is in fact imparted by number A, extremely stable sugar phosphate backbone. The carbon-carbon bond in the sugar are resistant to chemical attacks under all conditions except strong acids uh, at very high temperatures. The second reason is the bases themselves, except for cytosine of course, are very stable. And the third important reason is that the double helical structure of DNA provides the bases with hydrophobic rings with a great protection against chemical attacks. The hydrophobic structure of the bases causes them to stack so tightly that water is almost completely excluded from the stacked array. And this keeps at bay all water soluble compounds or molecules to reach hydrogen bonded charge groups and create any problems or disturbance there. Now, 
at last i will also talk about a very important aspect of dna acting as a genetic material an ideal genetic material is that is its ability of dna to change through mutation and contribute to the process of evolution since uh, dna is the sole storehouse of the genetic information its base sequence must have provision for change if the organisms have to evolve through time the base sequence in dna may change by mutation which is the nucleotide i mean at the nucleotide level this mutation may take place through two principal mechanisms one is the chemical alteration of the bases second is the replication error by which an incorrect base is erroneously incorporated or an extra base is accidentally inserted or deleted in the daughter molecule